The new uh, European Commission president yeah. says that it will be impossible to reach a comprehensive deal with the UK by the end of the year. Do you then favour extending the transitional period? Well, we have been challenging the government on this for months because we've made the argument that trade deals take a long time, they're complicated obviously, um, and usually it's measured in years. And we've been saying you're not going to get it done in 12 months. Uh, Boris Johnson says, no, we will get it done in 12 months. And one of the things um, that we are most concerned to do is to make sure that if in six months' time uh, it's obvious that the deal isn't going to be done by the end of the year, that Parliament has to have the chance to say, look, don't crash us out without a deal. Let us have a say in what happens next. OK, but, but that this... all sounds very familiar from the last Parliament. You've well, been clear to say that the whole leave-remain divide is something you want to put behind you. Yeah. Actually, you just want to kick the can down the road again, don't you? No, we're talking about something else completely. We will leave the EU in uh, three weeks' time, and therefore the debate about leave and remain goes because we will be outside the EU. But it doesn't mean that we stop challenging the government about what the future relationship should look like because uh, once we've left, that future relationship with the EU is all important. Well, can um, you set people's minds at rest and just guarantee that, you know, if you walk into number 10 at some point in the future, you can guarantee that the UK will not be rejoining the EU. Can you make that guarantee? The, the, the argument about a second referendum was blown away uh, in the last election that we've just had. So the focus now has to be on two things. The first is, what is the relationship with the EU? But I think can it should you be make a close... that guarantee? Well, uh, I don't think rejoining is on the agenda. I mean, whether future generations want to do that is up to them, but it's not You'd on the agenda. You'd still hanker Look, after it? I mean, will you be just... shedding a tear on January the 31st? Look, I, I, you know, I made the case... Uh, for staying in the EU, but I accept the result not only of the referendum but of the general election, and we're leaving in three weeks' time. But that doesn't mean that the challenge to the government falls away with it. We have to challenge them on the deal that they are going to do. I think they're going to do a very, what we've been calling, hard Brexit, which will be damaging for businesses and for the economy. And it's our job to prevent them doing that. It's our job to make sure that they don't crash out of the EU without a deal, which will take jobs with it. So the idea that now somehow the Labour Party backs off from scrutinising and challenging the government, I think is wrong. We have okay. to. And, and then, of course, the next question will be, um, where are the future trade deals going to be? Are they going to be with America and on what terms? And we have to be in there for that challenge as well. And you've been challenging the government today, your party has, on yeah. Iran, the other big international story yeah. on our programme tonight. Um, just tell me, was Qasem Soleimani a terrorist in your view? Uh, look, he was, a, he was a man who did uh, terrible things. A um, terrorist? He's been, well, he's, he has been branded uh, as a regional menace and um, he has responsibility for many acts which all of us uh, would declare to be unlawful. But that's not uh, the point in issue here. The point in issue here is whether or not what the Americans have done is lawful or not. And, and the case simply hasn't been made out by the Americans. And our, our government, instead of challenging them and saying, look, if you're going to take acts like this, you have got to justify it, looks as if it's blindly following them. And that, that's my major concern here. Now, I'm pleased that today it looks as though, it looks as though um, there may be some de-escalation, and that's a step in the right direction. Um, but I still think that our government should be um, holding the Americans to account rather than blindly following them. Let's talk about your leadership bid then, because that's one of the reasons yeah. you're speaking tonight. Um, do you accept some responsibility for that election defeat, given that you pushed Labour to be more pro-Remain? And according to uh, the former MP, Gareth Snell, and I just quote from him, those of us in leave seats with small majorities in towns and small cities begged Keir Starmer to listen to us yeah. when we told him that the party's Brexit policy was losing us votes. He wouldn't listen and we lost. Do you take responsibility for Look, that? We all have to take responsibility. I went across 44 constituencies in this general election and with every campaign team we talked about what was coming up, what people were saying to us and there were many reasons. There was the leadership, right or wrong. There was the Brexit position different issues on the Brexit position. There was the overload of the manifesto. There was anti-Semitism. And we need to understand and address all of those reasons. Collectively, um, we lost the trust 
uh, of the public to be a force for good and a force for change. And we need to address that. But I don't think it was any one issue. And I think some of them were longer term issues. If you look at some of the seats we lost in the Heartlands, these are seats which we've been losing over many, many years. Now, Brexit exacerbated that. Other issues exacerbated that. But I think the idea that there's one single reason and that's the silver bullet, you deal with that and then all our troubles are over, is not properly to analyse what's happened. Well, and what I want to do is focus on where we go from here and well, how we rebuild our party. Well, let me put that to the test because I want to just know how many of the policies that you've just stood on you'd keep. For example, do you still want to compensate WASPy women? Do you still want free broadband for all? Are those two policies look, at the heart of your manifesto? Do I, you I'm still... Gonna, are they keepers? I'm, I'm not going to go through each and every issue... Uh, no, policy. In our manifesto. There were really important um, manifesto commitments that we made, which were um, we would keep. But I'm focused would on this. Would you keep the, those two, the, though? Because I think the, it's the, important that people know where you're travelling. The next election is likely to be five years' time. But you and are standing for election now, different election, yeah, I agree. But I those two policies, I just want to gauge where you're travelling to as potential leader. The fundamental shift in our policy from 2015 to 20. 17 and then to 2019 to a more radical politics was the right fundamental shift. Big issues like being a party of anti-austerity, being a party that wants to invest in our public services and in manufacturing. Really important shifts and I'm very concerned that as we move forward we don't either trash the last Labour government or trash the last four years. But I'm equally clear that what we, the question we have to answer now is, what is going into your manifesto in 2024? What have you got to say for the late 2020s and the 2030s? Because the Labour Party only wins elections Just when it can glimpse the future and spell out how that can be better. And, and that is going to be in probably 2024, maybe okay. before.